whole nother level, but we still keep it ghetto. Whole nother level, but we still keep it ghetto. Welcome to episode eight of the Process of Hip Hop. I'm Brian Joseph, writer, blogger at theprocessofhiphop.com, and as always, it's all about the process. In today's interview segment, I'll be talking to MC Jahi. Jahi is originally from East Cleveland, Ohio, now residing in Oakland, California. He is an active participant in the hip-hop world, both as an MC, DJ, and lecturer. He is also a professor at Holy Names University. He is also a member of Public Enemy 2.0, which includes Chuck D, Professor Griff, Davey DMX, and DJ Lord. So let's get into it. I'd like to welcome to the process of hip-hop, MC Jahi from the Bay. What's going on, man? Hey, what's good, man? What's good, man? Brian, I appreciate this opportunity, man, to uh, rock out and, and have a good conversation on your podcast, man. This is how you preserve the culture. This is this will become an artifact. At the end of this conversation, we've created another artifact for the culture. So, salute. Absolutely. Man, I wanted to ask you, you have been around for a while, have definitely kind of survived through the golden era of hip-hop. You are a professor now, you know, a curator of the of the genre. How did you get started in hip hop, man? Take me through that journey. Mm. You know, for me, man, um, you know, I have to start really with my mom off top because she had the first record collection that I had that I ever seen. You know what I'm saying? And the music of the 70s that she was playing became the breakbeats of the culture in the 80s. So I really have to say, without any conversation, just my mom playing James Brown, uh, funky music in the house, you know what I'm saying, and dancing. And, you know, I, I, I always like, like I don't want to skip over. My, you know, the television wasn't as, was not as important as the record player. And my mom had records all over the house. And I think that that played a big role that I didn't realize until later in life. But my older sister, I had a sister five years older, man. She bought Rapper's Delight, man. Light blue vinyl cover with the with the rainbow yeah. on it. <laughs> right. The reason why I know is that, you know, school is 180 days. She played that thing 180 <laughs> days every single morning of the year. Um, so, I, you know, that was 79. And then... You know, uh, I grew up in East Cleveland, Ohio, man. I've been living in the Bay for 20 years, but I'm originally from Cleveland, man. And, um, you know, I first got on the microphone, you know, at 13 years old, man. Um, you know, I would have to say the singular song that really caught my attention beyond anything was Suck MCs by Run DMC and Jam Master J. Yes, indeed. When I heard that, I was like, okay, wait a minute, because they sound like grown men, but they were really fly. The style that they had... Uh, the confidence, you know, hip hop is about, you know, giving us confidence. And they gave me a jolt of confidence um, here in Sucker MCs. And then, you know, I was just blessed to live in a neighborhood, man, where we had cabaret DJs on the block that let, let us get on the turntables. We would block our streets off and have block parties because they was going back and forth to New York picking up records. But they also picked up, wow, this is happening in a park and outdoors. So, you know, uh, 14212 Savannah Avenue was is was centered in the middle of a block that they would cut off maybe four times a year. And we got a chance to get on the mic, man. You know, uh speak our words, uh get the cardboard boxes, break dance, get you some canvases and put your graffiti up. You know, um, so the four elements was in my neighborhood as a kid, man. Um, so I yeah, I always try to go back to those humble beginnings because I could easily fast forward to 1999. First for first uh, local artist from Cleveland to perform at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, opening for Public Enemy, and I wasn't in pub Public Enemy at the time. I never knew Chuck. I just got there early. Yeah. And when I got there early and went backstage, Chuck D and the whole PE crew was backstage, and Chuck was like, "Yo, you the dude opening?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he checked out my set. He didn't know me from from nobody, but he checked out my set and then got at me and was like, "Yo, stay at it. You got a good voice." Here's my digits. And and that humble moment has led to a an incredible 20-year career where public enemy is is a really a major part of my narrative, man. It's not the only part, but it's a major part um, of my narrative. But again, it wasn't like uh it wasn't anything, man, more than sheer determination and will. You know, um, I knew I wanted to be something in hip-hop culture. 
I felt like I had something to add. I wasn't a teenager when I started. I was same age as Chuck. Chuck was 28 when he started. I was 28. So I'd already lived some life, became a father and worked and, you know, kind of saw where hip hop was in my beginning years and how I loved it. And then, you know, the early 90s, you know, I had to take a dip away from hip hop because I wasn't into gangster rap. Thank God for di- uh, uh, people like Diggable Planets, the Fugees, Arrested Development, you know, folks like that, uh, Guru, you know, like they they helped me to, when I went back to see what was up with hip hop, I was able to find that. And then I saw the rest of everything else and I was like, I'm out. I was in the Roots Reggae music, man. But, you know, always credit, man, and forever will credit, man, East Cleveland, Ohio, Savannah Avenue as my birthplace and start for hip hop. And, and, it's interesting because Cleveland has become somewhat synonymous with 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 one one group, you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony. And as a result, for those people that are not really into or or I'll say as up on Cleveland hip hop, they think there's only one style, that there's only one subgenre of Cleveland hip hop and that's it. So what led you to come out to the Bay Area? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I'll tell you that, but I just just a little bit about Cleveland as well. There was a group called Brothers for the Struggle. There was two artists, uh, Pratt and Tank. They did a song maybe in 84 called I Want to Rap. And I heard that and I was like, wait a minute. I just saw them yesterday. You know what I'm saying? And they let me know, like, wait a minute, you could rap and put it on record. Oh, man, I didn't realize that. You know, um, so shout out to Bone Thugs and Harmony. But, but again, they came out in 93. 293 yeah, uh, and it was already there was already i mean bango b-boxer um man it was so many people that came before dj i'm um, man grand, grand wizard johnny o and club style uh 108 fm uh wdmt if it wasn't for johnny o and club style i don't think any of us would have we would have been really late on catching up to what hip-hop was so I always got to shout them out um understanding my pioneers man and um what got me to the bay man was one, uh, Davey D, who is a legend, um, hip-hop historian, um, originally from New York and here in the Bay. Um, I had my first album, uh, Higher Elevation, had a song on there called uh, Power Moves 2000. Um, wow. And he was playing that song out here. And I had never even been to the West Coast. And uh, at the time, uh, Ella Baker Center was doing a campaign about uh, closing youth prisons and and reading books instead of putting kids behind bars, and they had a you know an event at Fell Park in San Francisco. They took a flatbed truck and put some speakers up on it, and had a lot of us performing. Guapale was like a kid at the time. Zion a, Zion I these are Bay Area legends. They were kids yeah. at the time, and um, Van Jones, who was the executive director of the Ella Baker Center at this time, which is crazy, uh, bought my first ticket out to Oakland to come rock. And when I landed, you know, it was just something, you know, I don't know, you know, you travel places and, you know, be like, oh, this is cool. Do what you got to do and get out of it. But it was something about the Bay that attracted me. And it was um, the people, um, the independence. Again, you know, hieroglyphics and Too Short is from the Bay and E-40. Oh, yeah. Short. So this the independent hustle. If you got something good and quality, you could actually make something of yourself. Um yeah, as a grown man, I don't want to deal with no more winners. So, you know, <laughs> like it's it's February right now. I'm not going to Oh, yeah. Look, I'm all, I'm having this conversation outside, you know, um yeah, and then also um I left Cleveland and moved to DC and and, and I had I got mad love for DC, but at the time, you know, I was really clear that DC is a go-go town. They are DC owned town. And, and what I was trying to do lyrically and style-wise wasn't the right fit. So um, I saw that the Bay was an opportunity for me to, like, have a fresh start. And then I knew if I wanted to get on my independent independent hustle, it wouldn't be foreign to this place, you know. So, um, yeah, man, here I am, t- man, 20 years later, man. Um, been been in the Bay 19 years uh, of that 20 years, man. And, um, yeah, this is home. While I'm in the United States. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Well, and it's interesting because being a Southern California native, I can definitely attest to, you know, yes, we are all West Coast and it's a, yeah, you have a California MC contingent, 
but the Bay Area definitely has their own style. They have their own culture. Big shout out to all the Northern California Bay Area MCs. So again, you, you talked about talked about a lot of them. Now, when you when you started in '99, what was that? Tell me about that first single, that first project that you dropped that you really felt that this was going to be something that you were going to be able to pursue for a mm. long term. Yeah, well, you know, uh, in in '98. I went into the studio just to see if I had the chops because, again, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't lost my love and passion for hip hop, but I wasn't an active MC, you know, for, yeah, I was a father, you know what I'm saying? I had two children, I have two sons at an early age. By the time I was 24, I was a, excuse me, a husband and a father. So my, my priorities was, you know, food, clothing, shelter, safety, security, security yeah. transportation, you know, but 98. I knew, you know, looking at where I was working at the time and the field that I was in and the older people was like, yeah, you know, you see my chair, you can have this chair in 20 years. And I kept saying to myself, I don't want that chair <laughs> in 20 years. So I got to think about what else am I going to do? And, um, you know, I got so much love and respect for hip hop culture. I went in the studio in 98 just to see if I had the chops because the last thing hip hop needs is another whack MC somebody who don't got the chops to really do it, you know, and actually can damage the culture more so than add something to it. So, you know, I got in, did a couple songs and felt like, you know, this might be something that I could really do. I had a song called It's All Good that I was, um, that really like was a kind of an underground classic and helped me to get my first like shows, 98, early 99. You know, and the crowd reaction to what I was doing was like a confirmation. Like, like okay, because, you know, Cleveland artists, I mean, Cleveland uh, audience, if you whack, they're going to let you know yeah. right away. Like, get off the stage, get up <laughs> out of here, right. and let some real people get on the mic. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't get that. Um, so by 99, I was buzzing, man. By, by 99, I knew I knew the direction I was going. Um, I made a, you know, a decision that I was going to be a socially conscious you know, MC, I never ran away from that word being conscious. Consciousness is only awareness. Um, I knew I wouldn't go be gangster. I wouldn't go try to disrespect people. I knew I was going to represent a lane. And because I knew the history of hip hop, I knew that I had great shoulders to stand on. You know what I'm saying? Like what I was doing wasn't such an anomaly. Um, and yeah, you know, the Rock Hall had a contest. BT was doing a hip hop exhibit at the Rock Hall. The radio put out a contest. It was about a couple hundred people, you know, it wasn't just rappers. It was like a variety show battle. And I won that battle. And that's how I became the local first a local artist to play at the Rock Hall. And from there, you know, I was just like, OK, we doing this, you know, and and first record high elevation, pressed up myself, sold a thousand copies out of my trunk, you know, got featured in the Source magazine. And I was like, OK, let's go, you know, let's go. That's and um, that's how the journey started. Now you have an affiliation, obviously, Public Enemy 2.0. How did that start? When, when I mean, you you talked about your initial meeting with Chuck D. How did you become part of Public Enemy 2.0? Yeah, well, you know, um, uh, the seeds were planted in 2006, 2007, around the 20th anniversary of uh, It Takes a Nation of Millions. Uh, Chuck gave me the slot to be the opening act and MC for the entire tour. Um, and it was uh, Public Enemy and X Clan on that bill. Oh, uh, X Clan. <laughs> yeah, which you know, bitch. Before Public Enemy, before KRS One, the first people took me on my t first tour, in 1992, was X Clan. Um, like, like early, early on, when I wasn't even trying, I was playing, I was playing a role of security. But um, in 2006, when I did that tour, Chuck said to me, James Brown, Bobby Bird, and kind of left it in the air. And I was like, okay, I get that. You know, if you know anything about James Brown, Bobby Bird, James Brown would leave. But he, James Brown said, everybody over here, Bobby Bird, get on up. Everybody right here. Yeah. Get into it. And That's I was me. like, I was like, yeah, I, I, I get what Chuck was saying just in terms of the, the beginnings of this idea of a rap group and a rapper and a hip hop artist, MC, historian, uh, elder statesman now preparing the next generation to pass the baton not that he getting old and he out the game because i was just with chuck last week and he, yeah, he chuck rhymed, still rocks he'll, it yeah. he'll rhyme circles <laughs> around anybody right right but but he was he was preparing me for 
the idea of PE 2.0, which, you know, we call Pro Project Experience Millennium, which really is just the cultural continuation of public, it's like continuing the cultural legacy of public enemy as an MC and as a human being too, because I'm an educator, because I'm trying to preserve the culture, as you said at the beginning, um, you know, relationships move at the speed of trust. So um, I think, you know, many years of having conversation with Chuck where we weren't even talking about music, you know, it was, it was about children or he would be driving from New York to Atlanta or Atlanta to New York. And we would just be chopping it up about the state of hip hop and many things, you know, inside and outside of culture um, developed this really brotherhood. Um, and, you know, that's 2006, 2007, you know, 2011, Chuck was like, you know, I think I think I want to position you for something, but we hadn't titled it. And then one night in my email, I got the logo for PE 2.0. And when I saw the logo with the PE logo in it, uh, I was iconic. like, oh, my wow. God, this is happening, you know. <laughs> and immediately the, the, the way you know something is happening in our camp is you got to do a record, you know. So the charge was three things. A, you got access to the catalog. So pick instrumentals out of the catalog that you either want to like cover like i covered louder than a bomb um yeah you know like i covered that and then some you could like revisit like what they need uh i did the chorus the same way but then i revisited and put new lyrics to it right um and then you know i took beats like sophisticated b i took that beat and turn that into beautiful, wonderful, and just wrote entirely new lyrics that was totally different. So that was pretty much the charge. Um, and it started in 2012, man. And here we are, man, uh, five albums later. <laughs> you know, five albums on the P 2.0 um, as the moniker. Um, man, yeah, 36 songs, six music videos, and two world tours, you know, off of that. And um, yeah. Uh, now, who, now, who does the the production on P 2.0 is that still with the Shockleys or is that who's doing the production on that? Well, you know, um, uh, uh, I was, I was able to use some of the original bomb squad stuff, but also had divided souls, um, out of, out of Louisiana. I had DJ Payne one. Um, I, I got a joint by, uh, uh, the, the great easy Mo B. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, the last, you know, P 2.0, the last record really was mostly Payne one. DJ Payne one. Um, yeah. And, you know, got KRS on there twice, you know, mm -hmm. um, Chuck is on there, you know, KRS bless me, man. Um, you know, again, you know, as I've had this relationship with PE, I've also had that relationship with KRS one as well. And, you know, I sent him two beats and he sent me back verses to both of them. And I was just like, uh -huh. okay, it's, <laughs> it's like happy Kwanzaa. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, mm. but, um, you know, and, and, the next P 2.0 record, um, which is now in writing stage, it will be the, the production will be by the band. And the band is basically uh, the legendary Davey D, uh, DMX, um, who's in the Rock Hall twice for Run DMC and Public Enemy. He's the bass player for, for PE. Kyrie Wynn, who's out of Memphis, uh, and T-Bone, who's out of North Carolina. They'll be handling most of the production because it's going to be a live sonic. It'll, it'll be more live this time than, than recorded tracks. Mm. Well, brother, you're a professor at Holy Names University, and you also released not too long ago your memoir. And I thought it was mm -hmm. interesting. You, were, you, were, you, and, and I want you to definitely talk about that. But you were talking about how MCs over 40 should release a release a memoir. Tell me what was the inspiration, yeah. though, behind yeah. that, and how you actually wrote that. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, again, it comes from Chuck D. Man, it's, it's when you're around an elder statesman like Chuck. You know, you listen twice and speak once. And Chuck had said, he was like, you know, man, we got to tell our stories, man. And, um, you know, if you're over 40 and you put some work in this game, you need to write your story, you know, to be able to tell. And he had to, he had to say that to me twice because I'd already been thinking about a memoir. And I always call this like a, this is like the, you know, that's why it's called Influences, Messages and Notes from the Stage because it's almost like inside my personal diary of, songs that influenced me and then some incredible things that I've done on stage that I just wanted to share. Not so much as like, look at me and get some shine and clout. It's like, nah, for the kid that is at home right now, that's 17, thinking about wanting to get in this culture, 
and looking at the current state of things and thinking that it may not be a place for them. It's like, no, it is a place. I'm an independent musician. I've only had one major deal. Everything else I've put out on my own, you know, blood, sweat and tears and trial and error. So, you know, the memoir is like, you know, and at the end, I think at the end of the memoir was really my, my whole idea was, you know, um, I was writing under this style of everything had to be at least a thousand words. That was my kind of my internal process. And then I wrote a message to hip hop in a thousand words and just to call for unity, just to call for us to be entrepreneurs, for us to not have phony beasts with each other, to expand the culture for people in Africa, not to imitate the worst of us, but represent the best of us. You know what I mean? So it's just my labor of love and really following the heat and the call from our leadership, you know, and Chuck said, put out a book. So enemy books, here we go. You know, we got our own way of doing things. Um, and I'm actually on my way to class in, in about 12 minutes to, you know, I teach at Holy Names University. I teach a course called Hip Hop in the Contemporary World. And for the culture, I did something. I made Chuck D's book, This Day in Rap and Hip Hop History, and Rock Hem's book, Memoir, uh, Sweat the Technique, required reading for the students. So yes. it's required. So for the culture, it's like required. Like, you want to be in this course? You got to read these books, yeah, you know, yes. and, 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 you know, really humble and honored in 15 minutes, I'll be teaching Rock Hem chapters one, two, and three, <laughs> you know, showing, right. my, showing my students, uh, 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 the connection between him rhyming about Soul Train and then being on Soul Train. Yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? So, mm -hmm. and again, like you said at the beginning of this, man, um, this is our culture. You know, hip hop is a world culture with life affirming principles. Regardless of what these blogs are saying, regardless of what the American commercial scope presents hip hop, I was in uh, last year, I was in three, I was on three continents and 13 countries. And hip hop is global. I saw people in Ghana rhyming in three languages. I saw people in Helsinki, fin Finland, who didn't understand English but had their hands up. When we said "put your hands up," so this is a global culture. And my my, I feel like our our roles and our jobs is to do good service for our culture, and not just for ourselves, not just to get the bag, but for future generations. So when they look back and say, "Okay, I saw everything that was in commercial, but what else was going on?" Yeah. I want you to see my, I want you to see our faces. So, uh -huh. you know, and, um, and, and and again, being a part of the public enemy family um, puts a level of responsibility on you in your pen game and your life game. But I'm thankful to have that. Now, what is the best way? Let me ask you for people to stay. You're doing a lot still, Jahi. What's the best way for people to stay in contact with what you're doing as an artist, but also, again, as a hip hop curator and educator? Yeah, you know, uh, Instagram at MC Jahi, uh, Twitter at Hip Hop Educate. Um, but my main source is always find me at my website, I am I A M Jahi, J A H I dot com. That's normally the places you'll find me. Um, and yeah, and I'm not a big social media person. I'm trying to, you'll find me. <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll find me at those spots. And then, um, yeah, uh, Holy Names University, you know, uh, jahi at hnu.edu. Um, we do a hip-hop book club uh, quarterly. We're doing another one coming up, uh, reading Dapper Dan's book and then having some featured guests. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out there. Man, well, Jahi, professor, author, artist, Public Enemy 2.0, man. Thank you so much for joining the process of hip-hop. Best of luck to you in the future, brother. My man, I appreciate you, man. Salute. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Process of Hip Hop. Join us next week for our next episode. The Process of Hip Hop is produced and edited by me, Brian Joseph. Executive produced by Dale Harewood. Music by DJ Big Mike of Realside Records at realsiderecords.com.